Uh, thank you, uh, Georgia and Maurizio. And, um, I stand here as a sort of politician, I suppose, um, with uh, health interests. Um, I suppose uh, if you ask people uh, in a country like mine, about 50 million citizens, how many people work in health, uh, you will be given various figures, depending on whether they include the doctors or the doctors and the nurses, or the doctors and the nurses and the ancillary workers. Uh, or perhaps the researchers and the scientists and the, uh, and the NGOs, maybe. But of course, the answer is 50 million. Because every patient, every citizen, is or should be working in health as well. That's my view. I uh, have long been an advocate for uh, patient centered health and social care. Uh, I often say that my qualification for being, as you heard, a, a health minister and then a health spokesman in the European Parliament is not that I'm a doctor or nurse or a scientist or health manager or anything, any of those things, uh, but I am a patient. Uh, seven years on from a diabetes uh, diagnosis and uh, two from a triple heart bypass, uh, plus various other bits and pieces, uh, I am not perhaps a totally informed patient. Uh, but I, I am perhaps a better informed politician about health. And it's from both perspectives, uh, patient and politician, that I've sought greater involvement uh, by patients in their own treatment and care, uh, in the decisions affecting them, uh, but also in the planning of uh, health and social care services. Uh, and now, of course, we have added impetus uh, given to that aim by the economic events of the uh, past few years and by advances in uh, medicine and science uh, and not least of course uh, in and towards personalised medicine. Uh, and it's for everyone's benefit. Individuals, families, governments, health services, health professionals, that we should open the doors and remove the obstacles to a greater involvement at all levels by citizens who whether or not they're currently categorised as patients have a continuous and direct interest in their good health and their care and treatment when illness occurs. But if you listen to the, uh, the health service mood music, when patients try to get involved, you hear these sort of things. Uh, could I have some information to patients? Uh, it's best not, might need to advertise them. Could I have a right to choose my own doctor or the hospital for my treatment, you should take what's available and be grateful. Could I see my patient record? Good heavens, you wouldn't begin to understand it, and if you did, it would frighten the life out of you. Uh, what about some patient mobility rights? Yes, of course, but uh, it'll take a little time. Uh, we have to make sure that your choice to go abroad or whatever doesn't interfere with our right to have total control over our health service budgets and provision. Or I don't particularly like the drugs that, that I'm on, you're giving me for my schizophrenia or whatever. What are the alternatives? You really must realize that uh, you're ill, not capable of uh, making decisions like that. We know what's best for you. Trust me, I'm a doctor. Uh, or I should prefer a, a new type of hearing aid that I've read about. That's what happens when the tabloids newspapers start writing about medical stories. We can't afford every new device or drug that you may read about, you know. The health service is short of money. Those are um, exaggerated but real sort of responses that uh, one hears. And yet if you pick out the truths behind the dismissive replies from officials, you see exactly why we need more patient involvement in their own treatment, in planning, and in raising health standards. And the key truth, of course, is that we shall not be able to afford the cost of illness unless we recruit citizens to be partners in the campaign to prevent disease and disability, and to promote good and physical health, and then to have a part to play in managing their own ill health when that occurs. The second truth is that uh, in the age of the internet, Patients will be increasingly informed about their condition and the options available and be therefore 
more reluctant to accept what is handed down by health service or health professional authority. As patients, we, and I say we, want to share responsibility, not to have total responsibility um, for our treatment and care, but to have a part to play in it. And the uh, key to this second truth, of course, will be the quality, the reliability, the objectivity of the information that we receive and the people giving it to us. Uh, and there's a good financial reason for involving patients that should penetrate the densest political mind. In my lifetime, we've seen so many advances in medical science and practice uh, throughout Europe and in many parts of the world. We've had seen diseases uh, overcome. We've seen a healthier, longer living population, but eventually with later years of high dependency, often with physical or mental frailty, and a disproportionate amount of health and social care resources inevitably going to older people. We've seen travel and population movements and climate change bringing previously unknown or rare diseases to our shores. We've seen medical science moving at an exciting pace, but the new drugs, the equipment, the therapies, the treatments that it brings mean new cues and escalating costs. And now, of course, we see genomic and biomarker research opening doors to more accurately targeted drugs and treatments with a heightened need for patients to be involved, but an even more challenging task in educating them to that importance. And my message then is that the individual needs to be listened to and encouraged to take decisions about uh, his or her treatment. I have diabetes, as I said. Every few months I go for a, a checkup, and after a happy half hour talking politics, we discuss my diabetes. And I open up the uh, uh, conversation by um, telling him how my, um, uh, my neuropathic feet are getting on. He tells me what the results of my blood and urine and eyesight tests are. He gently mentions my weight. Uh, and uh, I then bring out a carrier bag of uh, items I picked up from newspapers or from visiting uh, conferences and going around the stands and ask if any of these new ideas would uh, be suitable for me. And usually they, they don't. Uh, occasionally they do. And uh, I nearly always take his advice. But on one occasion I didn't. It was my decision. Because he, there was a new drug he thought might be good for me, he said. And I said, well, what's the uh, side effects of that? And he said, oh, not much. You might occasionally get a dry mouth and um, occasionally slur your words. And I thought, perhaps not as a politician. <laughs> Well, in fact, my, my diabetes was uh, discovered, not by a doctor, but by uh, a second-hand car dealer. Uh, he was a friend. He suggested that I might have a blood sugar problem. His advice on cars was usually good. And uh, so I asked, they tested, and I did. Uh, and the lesson is uh, not that I should be diagnosing or prescribing for myself, or that we should be checked out at the same time as our cars, our service, it, it is that the individual should be educated to understand and then consulted and empowered to help take decisions on treatment and care options when appropriate. Uh, it also perhaps highlights the need for ongoing education and training for all our medical professions. And it certainly underlines my belief that we should be treated with respect as people as well as, as patients. It is not just about respect for the individual patient. It's not just about uh, compliance, important as both those things are. It's about recognizing that patients are experts. I'm an expert in the diseases that I live with. I challenge anybody to say they are a better expert than the person who lives with my type of diabetes, my particular uh, heart problem, my lymphedema, and various other things. I know what it's like. I know more than my medical advisor can know. He will know other things much better than I. He will know the science. He will know the, uh, the causes, the uh, cures. But I know what it's like living with it and living with the side effects of the treatments that uh, I'm given. And so that's an expertise we too often undervalue. Uh, we should uh, be brought in as uh, experts 
uh, through our personal experience. And uh, many of us, or even most of us, are capable of being trained or educated up to the standard which can make us effective partners in our care. I have to say I don't believe at the moment we are, uh, and uh, that is uh, one area where uh, uh, perhaps in Maurizio's uh, list we should make sure that uh, it goes right back into our education system. Um, because it is about a partnership, it's not a partnership of, of equals, uh, but it's a bond between professionals and patients. And that goes for prevention, treatment, lifestyle decisions, service planning, clinical trials, health technology assessment, and so on. It's about listening and bringing together the expertise of living with illness, the expertise of treating and caring, and the expertise of living with the drugs, the therapies, the care regimes that results. But it can't, of course, just be uh, a matter of over to you. It has to be supported by education, training, and monitoring to ensure, to enable the patient to be more in control. And we need education as to the nature of the illness, the likely side effects of medication, training on to how to use medical devices, such as the equipment I use to uh, self-inject twice a day, how to benefit from environmental aids, who to go to for reassurance, for help, for advice. It means non-intrusive monitoring of how I'm coping, understanding that personalized medicine means that not all medicines are appropriate for everyone. That's a major political problem. I know as a politician, we remember it with Peter Interferon, everybody with uh, multiple sclerosis said, me too. And we knew, the doctors knew, the patients I think really understood. They weren't, it wasn't suitable for everyone, it was suitable for some. And eventually we people put it onto the hospital prescribing. But uh, with personalized medicine advancing, we should be able to uh, explain to patients that actually their type of this disease is not appropriate for this type of, uh, of drug or treatment. Uh, but that is uh, a major, major challenge that we have uh, uh, ahead. Uh, if we win on that, then we can overcome the current uh, emphasis on postcode lottery uh, for prescribing. Uh, but um, just as school education leads to literacy and numeracy, health education and training should lead to health literacy and health numeracy and also health technology, confidence and competence. Well, when I in the UK introduced uh, legislation to give people with disabilities the right to direct payments, the response was shock horror. How could such people possibly cope? But to me, the important question was how to give the person more independence and dignity and freedom to choose the services to match his or her assessed need. After that came the question of how you enable people to cope with the freedom to purchase one's own services, rather than having to accept what the local authority uh, provided. And it's not a universal panacea. Uh, it uh, means an enhanced quality of life for many, perhaps even most. But for some, of course, uh, it's a step too far, and they want to continue with that uh, helping hand, that managed system, and that's fair enough. Choice should be choice as to whether one accepts new options as well as uh, having the new options. Uh, but of course, the, uh, the system for payments also proved that it can be cheaper once the initial structures have been set up and training is given. And there too is a lesson for personalized medicine. Living with or through one's illness can uh, play an invaluable part in helping professionals to take uh, decisions, uh, and the same is true of a close family uh, member. And that's why uh, I will always uh, put great emphasis on uh, patients being involved in, in planning certain <coughs> services. And uh, as a minister, I established a users and carers advisory group that met with me directly and regularly on an agenda set by them. And also, I always remember visiting a mental health hospital. Uh, a young man stopped me on the stairs and uh, asked if I was the minister, and I said yes, and people with me showing around tried understandably to uh, push him away and say, not now, the minister's busy, and I said, no, he's not. He wants to hear what, uh, what this uh, young chap has to say, and uh, he said, well, you know, I know when I'm going to be ill. 
And I said, yes. And he said, but if I go to my doctor, he says, you're not ill enough. Go away and come back when you're really ill. Uh, and so I do, and when I come back and I'm really ill, uh, then I cost everyone a lot more. It's more difficult to cope with me. I can't cope with me. The services can't cope with me. If I was able to come earlier when I know I'm going to be ill, then we could all save uh, uh, money and, and effort. And that young man, in that, those few minutes, taught me as a minister one of the gaps in the service, uh, which actually was a false economy, sending him away. And uh, it, uh, it needed that sort of uh, respite, uh, um, checking out that uh, one can provide, and we tried to uh, instill, insert that in, into uh, our uh, services. Well, the, uh, the next issue, of course, is uh, how we educate and enable people to, uh, uh, to, to uh, participate. We have to educate people, we have to educate governments, uh, and it's not just health ministers, we have to educate finance ministers. Uh, that they should invest in enabling people to protect their own health and to take greater control. And uh, uh, personalised medicine, of course, uh, should give finance ministers the reassurance that they would love to have, uh, that costs will be uh, better targeted and uh, controlled once the system has been installed. But you've got to get it installed first, that means investing in the process in right across the the board, but the reassurance is there if uh, finance ministers uh, will listen. So, we have to uh, uh, protect patients from poor information. Uh, I know from personal experience that if doctors can't or won't tell me what the problem is, it's happened with my uh, lymphedema ciliitis infection. Uh, I went to the internet and I looked on it and I uh, eventually found the symptoms of what I uh, had. The pretty poor, you know, pretty, pretty poor coloured leg, the texture and colour, the, the swelling, the uh, high temperature and all the rest of it. And uh, so there I found this was cellulitis um, and then I looked up the, the symptoms, I the, the treatments and the cures and I found myself in courage, and then I stopped to think, well, who's telling me this? <laughs> who's giving me this advice? And of course, uh, I didn't know if it was true, if it was reliable, or if it was mischievous, or if it was commercial. And I, as a patient, need to have that uh, reassurance that the information I'm given is objective, and it's as, uh, as good as can be got and that it's uh, in some way monitored for uh, quality and uh, validated. And the same is true, of course, uh, with the report that I produced uh, right in my time in the European Parliament on cross-border health. Uh, information for the patients who are thinking of going to another country for treatment is, uh, is crucial and it must be accurate and it must be uh, validated. Uh, but I believe uh, with that, and so uh, with that uh, report and directive now, um, comes in things like the uh, uh, more work on e-health, on health technology assessment, um, on the uh, reference of the Centre of Excellence, uh, which um, will uh, mean crossing borders in health is much more uh, effective and much more uh, possible. Um, but the future is uh, exciting, I believe. Uh, of course, there are many challenges. And of course, at the moment, if we hadn't spent all the money on the banks, we'd have more money to uh, spend on bringing in things like personalised medicine. We know that. And it's no good us trying to close our minds to it. We've got to get those problems sorted for us. But we do have a solution. We know that at times, at bad times, you need to spend more on health because more people have needs of health, physical and mental. We also know that here we have uh, one of the solutions to managing health spending uh, and um, efficient use of the resources that uh, uh, we have. Uh, and that's through the debate that's going on, which is leading to the reality of uh, personalised medicine. Albeit at an unacceptably slow pace, with uh, genetic testing failing to keep up 
with scientific advance in targeted drugs. Certainly uh, articles in British newspapers have been pointing that out uh, in the last uh, few months. But we are moving on towards a new type of medical supervision, leaving the person more in charge, more in control, taking their own decisions, but with the reassurance that uh, the monitoring system will pick up on the, any irregularities or calls for help. And clearly there's a, a, resist, uh, there's a, a risk that with distance monitoring, we're entering Big Brother territory, but so long as the monitoring is monitored and the individual feels comfortable with it, then I think personalized medicine and personalized living is going to open many more doors to independence and freedom of choice. But perhaps we still worry as to whether patients will be able to cope with more responsibility and to move away from that uh, keeping tight hold of nurse uh, belief that we were brought up with. But patients themselves will tell you that they support more risk taking. They know they need risks to be taken if their uh, conditions are to be overcome. And that's true whether it's research, whether it's new medicines, or whether it's uh, trying out new methods of, of care. We as patients do not want to be automatically deemed incapable. We hate being talked down to. We hate being talked about as if we weren't there. We know we shall sometimes make mistakes, but life is not risk-free, whatever age we are, and whatever our health and care needs. The one question, I suppose, is whether we are yet robust enough not to go crying to the authorities or crying to the media if something, as it will, goes wrong. Thank you.